showcase Lawrence General Hospital's outstanding cardiovascular services and the team that makes providing these services possible. Our STEMI program began in 2008 and Lawrence General continues to lead the Merrimack Valley with our successful, successful patient outcomes. At Lawrence General, we were the first in the Merrimack Valley to implement radial artery cardiac catheterizations. And in early 2013, we will be the only community hospital to have the Impella, a cardiac assist device. Lawrence General is moving to be the first community hospital in the Merrimack Valley to offer same day discharge for PCI patients, solidifying our position as a leader in cardiovascular care. We have, two outs we have outstanding metrics such as door to balloon time less than 90 minutes, our monthly average is 62 minutes, our outcomes are so successful because of our outstanding continuum of care. From our highly trained EMS staff, our outstanding emergency center staff, our highly skilled and efficient cardiac cath labs team, our skilled and compassionate critical care and telemetry units, and our newest department, our cardiac rehab. However, our real success is because of our dedicated and skilled interventional cardiologists, Dr. Sunit Mukherjee, Dr. Seth Belazarian, and Dr. David Gossman. We would now like to showcase two success stories that had happened here at Lawrence General. We'll begin with Dr. Sunit Mukherjee, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Mukherjee. Seth, Dave Gossman, and myself, we're only as good as the team that we have, we have around us and all of you in this room. So first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. And I want to present a case with a wonderful outcome. Let me just see if I can advance this. So on the 27th of September, at approximately 5.30 in the evening, patient Ivan, a 63-year-old gentleman started having the onset of chest pain and pressure, shortness of breath, nausea, and vomiting. He has a history of a previous stent placement in 2007. He has a history of hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis. He took one nitroglycerin sublingually at home with aspirin, and when his symptoms failed to resolve, he contacted 911. Palin EMS arrived in the scene immediate to evaluate the overall situation. Now this is very important. The care that we're able to deliver at Lawrence General Hospital starts with what happens in the field. First responders, critical. So EMS applied oxygen, two liters, gave two additional sprays of nitroglycerin, Zofran for nausea, and then he was brought to the emergency department at Lawrence General Hospital. He was assessed. Entry time was 7-11. I don't know if I have a pointer, so I'm going to be a human pointer here. But what you see is a 12 lead EKG. These are the inferior leads here. And you can see that there's a significant amount of elevation. If you go over here to the lateral leads, you also see a good amount of elevation. So he clearly fits criteria for an ST segment elevation in mind. And as a result, this was activated as a STEMI. So before the team had arrived, there were several things that need to take place once a patient is diagnosed with a STEMI. They're given Berlinta, which is an antiplatelet agent, heparin, and fentanyl to control the pain. And he was then prepared to come to the cardiac cath lab. That's the cardiac cath lab, minus all of us. If you harken back to the 1950s, <laughs> this is the kind of team that we have. And that's, cr that's critical. And it's remarkable how patient after patient has commented on the fact that we do work terrific as a team. It's to the point that the team members know what the other person is thinking without us even having to say anything. So in any case, he arrives in the cath lab, quickly assessed. We decided to try to perform the procedure from the left radial approach. And that's one of the things that this hospital is just, it's incredible how quickly the radial approach for catheterizations has taken place. 
and particularly for patients having ST segment elevation MIs. So at 803, we were able to insert a six French sheath into the left radial artery to initiate the catheterization procedure. On the left, that's the human body. And you can see that traditionally, we've used a femoral approach. But we're a first, radial first lab here. And that means that we try to attempt our cases from radial approach. In the sheath that's inserted, which is just basically a catheter through which we're able to insert our other catheters to perform the catheterization pictures as well as to perform the angioplasty is on the right hand side of the slide. So this is a picture of the left coronary arteries. The catheter is to the left of the screen. It looks like a hockey stick. That's the left main coronary artery here. This is the circumflex artery here. And what's con conspicuously missing is a big branch that should continue down like this. And this is the artery that is leading to the infarct that Ivan is having. This is a picture of the right coronary artery. And initially, when we saw the EKG and he had the EKG changes, that would be more suggestive of an infarct involving the right coronary artery. In this case, the right coronary artery flow is fine. There's some minor placking, but overall, things look good. The culprit artery is the obtuse marginal branch that I showed you in the previous picture. What you see now is we have a different kind of a catheter, a guiding catheter. And this is the catheter that we perform the procedure through. <coughs> this is the artery, the branch artery that's blocked. And this is the wire that we were able to use to cross through the block, because she actually has a stent that was put in here that's an old stent, and that's what's occluded in this situation. You can see we've already restored flow here. Where there was nothing here, now we have some flow, and that's just by taking a balloon over the wire and inflating it, restoring flow to that area. This is the stent as it's being brought into the area that's blocked. That's the stent inflated. see how much better it's already looking. And this is what a stent actually looks like. This is the finger. That's how small it is. This is called left ventriculography. This is done to check the heart muscle function. And actually, Ivan was very lucky because his heart muscle function overall was pretty well preserved, even with the heart attack. <coughs> so at 845, we took the sheath out of the radial artery, we put a TR band, that's a band that occludes the artery after the sheath is taken out to keep it from bleeding. 
and he left the cath lab feeling much better, almost 9 o'clock, to the CCU. Our door to balloon time for the procedure was 67 minutes. And ideally, we want to have a door to balloon time less than 90 minutes. So this was an excellent, excellent door to balloon time. The door to balloon time represents the amount of time that it takes from the time the patient actually arrives at the hospital to when we're able to use a balloon to inflate the area and to restore blood flow to that part of the artery, that part of the heart. The faster that's done, the better it is for the patient because usually it means less overall damage to the heart muscle. That's a CCU bed, well, a representation, I'm sure. He was in the CCU for 24 hours, continued on the aspirin and the Berlinta. In addition, we started on a few additional agents, an ACE inhibitor, statin therapy, and beta blocker therapy, things that we want to put people on, patients on, not just after they've had a heart attack, but if they have coronary artery disease. Then he went to telemetry 24 hours later, where he received a lot of post-MI education, which is key. And he went home on the 29th, feeling great. I have to thank Kathy Caridia for these slides, all of them. And before I take questions, Ivan, could you just stand up in the back? Thank you for coming. Ivan was a terrific patient that night, by the way, I have to tell you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. How does our door to the time compare with our partners at Beth Israel? It seems like we have a really great door to the time. I'm going to defer on that to Dr. Bilizarian and to Kathy. Our door to the time, I, I can't tell you what, what Beth Israel is. That sometimes they're a little different because. They get a lot of transfers in from um, different towns, so their door to balloon time starts as soon as the patient hits their door. So their, that time is a little bit different. Um, but for us, our monthly door to balloon time on average is about 62 minutes, which is outstanding. <coughs> yes, sir. How long does it take you to determine where the problem is once, once they get here? What artery? And where the problem actually is. So the question is, how long does it take us to figure out where the problem is with respect to where the blockage may be? The first clue is once the EKG is done in the emergency department. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of what artery could be involved. Now sometimes you can be fooled because, as in this situation with Ivan, the EKG seemed to suggest that the blockage was in the artery that goes to the bottom wall of the heart. But it turns out the artery that was blocked, that was causing the heart attack, went to the side wall of the heart. But that's usually the first clue of where the problem may be. Once that happens, and once we get them up to the cath lab, the catheterization procedure itself is actually pretty fast. And what's remarkable is it always seems as if it's taking a lot longer than it actually ends up taking. So from a realistic standpoint, if there's no problems in terms of getting access into either the artery in the wrist or into the groin, by the time we've taken our pictures, it shouldn't take any more than five to seven minutes from when we start taking the pictures to know where the problem is. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you, Sunit, for that presentation. And Ivan, thank you for uh, letting us share your story. And uh, thanks for the, everyone who, who contributed to this. So uh, what's already been said is uh, what I'd like to just reiterate. I, my hope for this one, uh, some people in here at Lawrence General had this idea of recognizing the STEMI program and, and uh, letting people know our appreciation for all the aspects of care was really try to achieve three things and some of it's already been covered but number one is to let more people in the community know what's going on here that the, the program is uh, not just doing good work but actually really on the forefront we're way ahead of even Boston hospitals and sort of several important quality areas like the radial uh, approach that has been discussed so that's number one. Number two, to demonstrate, I think, real appreciation for the continuum of care. This is really, uh, you know, the weakest link story here is just so important here that if somebody doesn't do a good job here, the patient really does suffer. So if somebody anywhere in the whole continuum, you know, the 
emergency uh, medicine guys, the EMS, paramedics don't do a good job, the patient suffers. The staff, physicians and nurses in the, in the emergency room don't. The patient suffers. If we don't do a good job in the cath lab, so at every step, the patient's whole care depends on everyone doing a really great job. So the second thing is to show appreciation. But the third thing is a sort of little thing that I was hoping would happen, and I'm, and I'm hoping that that will come about, is that this will sort of go out to the community that this is really important and that there's a public health message that patients really need to activate emergency medical services if they have crushing chest pain, heaviness, or tightness in their chest. Because what's been mentioned is this thing called door to balloon time, which is someone comes in our door, we've got to get the balloon in the artery as fast as possible, very fast if we can, but the current best practices is, is under 90 minutes and you heard we're doing about 62 minutes. But that really doesn't matter if the patient stays at home or sort of thinks about things before coming or thinks maybe this is just, just a heartburn and waits a few hours because during that time the patient's heart is really suffering and may be suffering irreversibly. And the, and the final thing I'll just say about that is that's again part of the public health message I would say is so just doing my weekly reading in journals. So this week in our cardiology journal called Jack, there's an article from uh, Ottawa, Canada, looking at their community and looking at what was the result of people who got taken to a hospital by emergency medical services that didn't have this kind of program, angioplasty, and what was the result if they had this kind of heart attack we're calling STEMI, a particularly bad kind of heart attack, and they went to a hospital that did have angioplasty. And the death rate, the, the number of people that died that went to a hospital without angioplasty was 11.5%. And the number of people that died that went to a hospital with angioplasty was 5%. So a dramatic, 11.5 to 5. So that's 6.5%. That's so we have this calculation that doctors do. So you take that 6.5, you do 100 divided by 6.5. And, and that comes up with a number of about 14. That's the number of people you'll save just by bringing them to a hospital that has angioplasty services. Every 14 people that come here and don't go to another hospital, even though those other hospitals are good but they don't have this service, that's the number of lives that are saved. And then the other thing was just two weeks ago showed that just by going from the groin access to the wrist axis, because there's less bleeding, every 33 people you do that way, you save one life. And this is not like some kind of just modest thing that happens, not a good thing like shorter length of stay or less bleeding. We're actually talking saving lives. So those are really uh, things that I was hoping would get out as a message that would get out to the community um, from, from, through all of you. I, I just uh, came back from the heart meetings and one of the things that struck me was there was an abstract from one of the top medical centers in the country, Duke Medical Center had an abstract evaluating the number of people in the hospital at Duke Medical Center that know basic CPR and how to activate CPR and call 911. And if you surveyed everyone, both clinical staff, nurses, physicians, and clerical staff, only 40% of the people knew basic 911 at one of America's leading medical centers. So that's the sort of secondary gain hope that I have for, for, for this kind of program. So that's, the, that's, that's that, and now on to the second so-called case here. The case is uh, of, a, of a gentleman who is uh, sitting here in the front. Uh, he's a 46-year-old man who had a past medical history only of high cholesterol. And he was working out, which is what we want our patients to do, to exercise, to try to stay fit. He was working out at the YMCA. And he felt some kind of unusual concern, something in his chest was a little bit concerning. And on his way home, he decided he wanted to stop at the Andover Fire Station, which was on his route home. So he stopped there, uh, knows uh, a lot of the guys there, and thought he might get some help. And uh, they basically said, you know, we need to evaluate you. And uh, he was put in the ambulance and began to assess him. And uh, he was having, on a, our scale of pain, a five out of 10 chest pain. Started on some medicines that we use routinely in heart attack, oxygen and aspirin. And uh, the, LG, uh, the Lawrence General Hospital paramedics came because they were called because of a concern that this patient, Brian, was having a heart attack. So this uh, is a really important part of the system. And this is really what I'm again hoping that we'll, we'll um, increase awareness about is that if Brian had decided to go home and discuss this with his wife and try to decide whether he should call his doctor, this would have all been delayed. And worse yet, if he had just gone home and decided, well, why don't we just drive to the hospital, all of this sort of good care that happens even before the patient comes to the hospital doesn't get done. So how do we get this message out? That's the point of the program. If you have any other ideas about this, let me know. We have some people from the hospital's um, uh, department that does promotional stuff, and that's my hope of this program tonight.
So on arrivals, Sunit already taught you how to read EKGs, but you know that uh, on, on this EKG, there are several areas of abnormality which suggest the underneath surface of the heart has an, uh, a blockage. <clears throat> so this kind of abnormality is this, you've heard this term STEMI, it stands for ST elevation myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is doctor speak for heart attack. So this is the ST elevation, those, that part of the EKG goes up and it indicates the artery is completely blocked and that's the concern. So uh, this, the team was notified in the emergency center. A page goes out, the, the receptionist in the emergency has a, a very simple strategy, just hit a button and pages go out to dozens of people all over the hospital knowing they gotta be ready for a patient who's arriving. So uh, Brian arrived at, at seven o'clock um, in the emergency room at 7.07, uh, 7.06, excuse me, that uh, trucks back and in there, gets unloaded, and comes in through our door at 7.06. This is the door to balloon time. On the web, if you wanna research this, there's a lot written about it. It's abbreviated the, number, the letter D, the number two, and the letter B, D2B. Um, his chest pain had improved just with some of the efforts that were done by the uh, paramedics and EMTs. And uh, he was given these medicines that are important, blood thinning medicines, because we know that this heart attack was caused over years of plaque that had accumulated in the wall of the artery that narrowed the artery. But on this morning at the Y, there was a clot that formed that completely narrowed the artery. And that's what we were treating urgently with these blood thinning medicines. So he's prepped and within uh, an, uh, well under 20 minutes, uh, he's being moved to the cardiac catheterization laboratory. So there's the catheterization lab. There's, uh, except for, three guys in suits, a bunch of good looking people, and then uh, we move on. So Brian arrives in the cath lab at 725, and, and just as Sunit said, it's, it's, you know, everyone is cooperative, but everyone has their thing to do. Uh, basically, moving put patient onto the table, uh, wiping the, the, the areas we're gonna be putting catheters with alcohol type preparations to clean the skin, hooking up EKGs, entering information into the computer, getting the x-ray equipment ready, opening sterile packages of catheters. It's all just going on around. And while we're doing that, of course, really rushing to achieve this door to balloon time, trying to also deliver compassionate care. Sometimes we admit that might get short change. We try to say things are going well, we're rushing, we want to let you know that what we're doing, but, but this is what we're doing. We have a particular kind of test called the Barbeau test, which makes sure that the two arteries to the wrist are both okay, so we can put a catheter in one of the wrist arteries. And then uh, this, within 10 minutes, that catheter is in. So that's pretty impressive if you think about it. The patient just rolls into a room on a stretcher, and in 10 minutes he has a catheter going into his heart. So that's, I think, pretty phenomenal. <clears throat> so there's an example of the catheter going into the arm. And here's some pictures. So we, we said that this, this patient had a suspicion of a blockage on the, right, on the underneath surface of the heart or the right coronary artery. So this is the front arteries, the left coronary arteries. We jet divide the arteries into sort of generally three zones, the front, the back, and the right. And this is a picture of the front artery coming across the front and the back artery there. The last uh, picture you saw, Ivan, was a, an artery in the back of the heart. This is uh, the front and the back, and these don't have complete blockages, so we know this is not the immediate problem. And then um, we move on to the right coronary artery, which is the suspicious artery, and you can see that this artery is completely blocked off. So um, you saw in the previous pictures that Sunit showed that this right coronary artery generally is a big C that sweeps around. So this artery looks like it's someone just took a chainsaw and just cut it off. There's nothing left there. So we know that this is the blocked artery and this matches up with the EKG. So uh, as Sunit said, we uh, basically prepare a variety of catheters in this situation. We know there's a lot of clot, so we put a catheter in to try to suck out the clot and actually move ahead and treat this. So the thin wire that you saw that, that Sunit demonstrated, this is a very thin wire. It's about the thickness of a human hair. It's 13 thousandths uh, of an inch thick and this uh, wire passes through there. And sometimes just by passing it through there, you can open it up the artery. So you can see now what was completely blocked just by putting the wire across is opened it up, but there's still a severe blockage right there. So then moving on, the next step, as I mentioned, is to use that catheter to, uh, to open it up and then subsequently to put a stent in. So this is the stent going in here, so across the area of blockage. So the, the two dots are on either side of that. Oops, and then after that result. 
So you can see basically an absence of a blockage that was there previously. So what was 100% is now not blocked there. So um, final result there, and this is again an example of what a stent looks, a wire mesh in the wall of the artery that has a coating on it that reduces the chance of re-narrowing. And then as, as um, you were shown previously, the underneath surface of the heart is evaluated and it is pulling up showing that it's had minimal amount of injury because of the speed with which this was done. So for the, for the un uninitiated in this, if you sort of use this as an analogy, if you put a really tight band around your wrist, think about how long it might take to have it start to be a little bit numb, and then it frankly start to hurt, and then frankly start to really not be able to do anything. That's what's going on with the heart. So within a few minutes, it starts to hurt, then it becomes dysfunctional, and if you take the band off and return oxygen to the hand, that hand will be saved. But if we don't do that, the hand is lost. So that's, the, that's the, what we're really rushing at with this whole approach. Um, so uh, at the end of this, uh, this, this little wristband goes on. Uh, pr previously, when we were doing these cases from the femoral artery, patients had a lot of issues with bleeding. It's harder to compress on that area than it is on our wrist. So that's what, many of the reasons why this is preferred for patient comfort. But as I described to you, it has something more important. It has a, an outcome benefit of, of reducing death. So uh, as Brian uh, told us in the laboratory that he uh, did not have any pain and that's really a very gratifying for everybody in the room. So patient comes in really often, really incredible pain, sweating, very uncomfortable, say, sometimes the patient will say, well, what did you just do? Because the pain goes away that instantaneously once we open up the artery. And the door to balloon time here, you know, D2B or DTBT, was 41 minutes, sort of even better than our, our average. So again, very helpful in terms of making an excellent recovery in terms of the heart, um, heart artery status and heart function. CCU again. Uh, Brian in the CCU for 48 hours, started on these medicines that are used after a heart attack and then discharge with a follow-up to, to discuss his long-term care with me in the office. Brian uh, was one of the early participants in our new cardiac rehab program, and um, I've uh, been a sort of a long-time uh, strong proponent of cardiac rehab. I tell patients, particularly young men like, like Brian, that it doesn't matter if you make a lot of changes, but if you make a few small changes with the long life that you have expecting ahead of you, 30 or 40 years, if you make 10% improvement in diet, 10% improvement in exercise, 10% of improvement in stress reduction, the long-term benefits to vascular health are really dramatic. And I can't achieve that in my office talking to patients for 10, 20, 30 minutes. So that's really the great value of cardiac rehab. So Brian tells me that he uh, benefited by that quite a bit. So here's some pictures of Brian. And uh, Brian, uh, Brian is my son's wrestling coach. And I'm gonna take wrestling coaching off maybe this year, but uh, hopefully get back to it very soon. And uh, he, and uh, he's been doing really well and uh, graduated from the uh, cardiac rehab program and uh, now enrolled in maintenance program. So hopefully uh, continues getting back to the why uh, and continuing physical activity and, and fitness strategies back there. So I wanna thank Brian and his family who came tonight and his wife and uh, thank you all for uh, so far uh, hearing this case, a second in our two cases and uh, I want to just uh, take any questions and hopefully get everyone out uh, in a timely manner and thank everyone for those three things, for uh, coming to hear about the highlights of this really excellent program that's really doing life-saving work. <coughs> um, I'll say another aside that I learned at the heart meetings is that hospitals that do excellent STEMI care, it's been shown in, in, uh, in a paper that I saw presented at the heart meetings, do other excellent care that you wouldn't expect. You might think about it, but Hospitals that do excellent STEMI care do excellent cardiac arrest care. Even though it's not really what we're talking about, all the systems that are in place to take good care of patients with a with heart attack have good care for other problems like cardiac arrest for non-heart attack causes. So that's one of the good things that comes about from this program. So, so uh, uh, recognition of that, appreciation for all the care that, that people give. And, and a lot's been already mentioned. Kathy did a good job mentioning it. It's from the pre-hospital, the, the ambulance services, fire departments, EMS, EMTs, paramedics, the folks here at Lawrence General that do the, that coordination, the emergency department, all aspects of the hospital care, the cardiac rehab, but, but one thing that I think is now increasingly being recognized is the family part of healthcare. 
and uh, it's really it's really an underappreciated thing in our healthcare system. We hear a lot uh, when I hear people in the public domain talk about things in the healthcare system, and I realize how little they know. Uh, one of the things that's uh, really remarkable is it's the thing that doesn't really get appreciated, like the small things that we recognize that uh, families do, making modest changes in diet or doing other kinds of things to support family members is really a, a critical part of the outcome of patients. And the patients who don't have that kind of support, we know don't do as well, regrettably. So, so um, I will say uh, that will be the end and take any questions and uh, stay on track here. Do I need the mic? No. Okay. I really wanted to be able to take this opportunity to say thank you. Um, I look out at so many of the familiar faces that, that worked with me just 20 weeks ago. Actually, 20 weeks, three days, and about 13 hours. Yeah. It, <laughs> it's absolutely remarkable what you do. And over the last few months, I've had the opportunity to be able to meet with some of you and to personally thank you for what you did for me and for my family. The response has been remarkably the same, regardless of what your role, your function, at, your function is. It's my job. It's what I'm paid to do. It's what I'm trained to do. Well, from my perspective, thank God it's your job. Thank God it's what you're paid to do, and thank God it's what you're trained to do because those routine functions that you do day in and day out mean a, a lot to people like me you make a huge impact on people's lives you made a huge impact on my life on the life of my wife and my four children my parents are here with, with us you know it's absolutely remarkable the, um, one of the things that really stood out at me was the care and the compassion that was used throughout that whole continuum that morning. Whether I was at the fire station, in the ambulance, checking into the hospital, up in the STEMI lab, etc. Every single step of the way, people explained exactly what was going to happen what I was going to experience. This was a point in time that was extremely terrifying to me. I didn't know whether I was going to walk out of this hospital again. I didn't know whether I'd see my kids again. And what you folks were able to do was to give me peace. When Dr. Bill Zarin walked in that room, I couldn't have been any more comfortable with what was happening. At peace with exactly, I was in the right hands, the right place, had the right people around me to have the best chance for success. And then I look out to folks like John Lovett. Now, John and I grew up together. John was just coming on to his duty, etc. Found out that I'm here, I'm in here. Well, one of the first faces I see when I'm done is John, standing right there next to me in the STEMI lab. He... I'm sorry, I'm trying to fix that. <laughs> but talk about people doing the neighborly thing. He leaves, he ends up seeing my wife, so he explains exactly what's happening to me, to her, and what had happened. So he put her mind at ease. He's leaving again. He sees my parents drive to the hospital because they're all concerned. So he walks with them and takes them exactly where they needed to go, explained exactly what was happening, and put their minds at ease. That's community. That's what makes Lawrence General Hospital awesome, is that it's a community. It's the ability to have great service 
right here in the Merrimack Valley. And that's the message we really need to get out. It's absolutely phenomenal. And being able to work together with the fire departments, all the first responders, et cetera, that's a team. And I guess in short, just thank God you guys do what you do. And, and I can't thank you enough. Um, and, and I, uh, you know, to Diane and the whole team at the Cardiac Cat Lab, it's been phenomenal. I've dropped 40 pounds since June 18th. And I told them in, in July, my goal was to be able to run the Feast of Five. Now whether run a little bit, walk a little bit, just to be able to do it. And, you know, they've worked with me toward that. And they've helped me along the way. They've kind of pulled me back a little bit when I was starting to get a little aggressive. But the whole continuum of care is absolutely phenomenal. So thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, and I think, as Brian said, that we, uh, we uh, obviously love our jobs, love to be able to provide useful things for our patients, but really greatly appreciate it when our patients uh, have great outcomes and are appreciative. My only regret now for this entire evening was that we only should have had only Brian speak, and then it would have been perfect. <laughs> but uh, other than that, thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy some refreshments, and uh, uh, hopefully everyone can uh, say hello to someone you don't know before leaving. Thanks a lot.